Dirt roads that bootleggers ran on helped pave the way for today's multi-billion dollar industry and the fastest growing sport in the world. Forever known as the Whiskey Roads, they lead to the super speedways of NASCAR. These stories about the history of stock car racing are truly a piece of Americana. There were three factors uh, in, involved in the formation of racing. Uh, the first was uh, guys coming back from World War II and uh, found out there was another world out there. When they came back, uh, they wanted to do, some of them wanted to do adventurous things and, and race was one of those things. Uh, second, there was the, uh, the old Ford automobile, which was very inexpensive to take one and make a race car out of it. And, uh, get their buddy in the sign shop, put a number on it, and buy them a football helmet, and they went racing. And then all, uh, while all that was going on, there was uh, uh, people up in the mountains that were building fast cars to transport the corn whiskey and, and sugar whiskey down to the Piedmont and other dry areas. They liked the old Fords too. They had young boys driving these cars down the mountain, mostly teenagers. They got involved in a lot of chases and you didn't want to get caught. Some of them never did get caught. The Junior Johnson never got caught. Known as the grandfather of NASCAR, Junior Johnson is arguably the most important and influential person in the history of stock car racing. As Wilkes County folks would say, he's a legend round here. The drivers now today don't know how they got to where they at. Basically, and uh, we went through the good part of racing. We had a great time of racing. It was a uh, adventure, a good part of racing. Now it's a professional type of atmosphere that you don't have fun with it. And it's a 24-hour job that you do all the time. And television and other things that's brought the sport to the level it is now taking away all that stuff that went on back in the old day. Today, racing has evolved from a strictly southern sport into a national American pastime. With multi-million dollar sponsors playing for high stakes, these sponsors demand winning teams that produce brand recognition in exchange for their millions. With nearly a third of Americans considered diehard racing fans, it's a good gamble with their money if they back a winning team with a well-behaved driver. Most of the early racers today wouldn't even be able to get a job on the teams even though they were great race drivers. They could not have represented the sponsor in a, in a meaningful way. Now Junior, on the other hand, he adapted to all this. Junior's a brilliant guy. Junior's brilliance in the automobile began well before he started racing at age 17. By then, he had already been hauling whiskey for years. One day in 1949, Junior's brother said he should take his whiskey hauling car down to the local speedway in North Wilkesboro. Junior went and ran his first race, coming in second. Sure beats plowing the field was his only comment about racing so well. I grew up in, in Wilkes County and lived on a farm, lived out of the farm. Around where I lived when I could first remember the bootlegging, moonshine and stuff was very large in the area where I lived at. And my dad was involved in it. He was one of the kingpins, you might say, of the bootleg business. His dad's involvement in whiskey making really meant that he made more moonshine than anyone else. This resulted in the Johnson family raid, where ATF officers busted up the largest moonshine operation in American history. And it was a 20,000 gallon steel, largest steel ever been seen. The Johnson family never did anything halfway. 
You know, you look at, at the people that were in that industry, even if it was illegal back back in the 40s and 50s, they had been in it, their, their ancestors had been in it a long time. To them, it really wasn't a bad thing. Uh, they were servicing a need as long as North Carolina and many of its neighboring states had dry counties, there was a tremendous need for their uh, product. It was just a way of life back then. Nothing, nothing to be ashamed of. That's just the way they had them making it. It's not robbing somebody. It's just a way of making a living. It was ABC in the highway the train. Yeah, the sheriff's departments knew you were just trying to make a living up yeah. there. It was a lot easier to haul that corn down the mountain in liquid form and it was in baskets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Back in 1935, a particularly well-established region for whiskey making was Wilkes County, North Carolina, where life wasn't very easy on the people in that area. That yeah. Bob Martin and Dave Graham remember the good old days of chasing whiskey runners. Standing in a field in Davie County, where one of their most memorable raids occurred, they reminisce about the good times and the dangerous times when Martin was almost killed. 38 five-shot pistol, and I fired two shots he ran around the house and into the woods. And you were laying there in the driveway. You were bleeding real bad. Wilkes County, however, was not known for violence. It was known for plain old good whiskey, and lots of it. Now, Wilkes County was the moonshine capital of the world. We had more agents, federal agents, stationed in Wilkes than they had uh, west of the Mississippi River. You know, it was sort of a way of life uh, in Wilkes County. And you know, frankly, the, the chicken business uh, in its early stages was the first alternative that a lot of farmers had to growing corn and making, making corn whiskey. So uh, uh, if you were in the chicken business, you had to know a little something about the background of the farmers that were uh, in it and the people that had been in it. And a lot of them had some connections there, and Junior was one of them. Their forefathers had, had made liquor legally. You know, you used to have little small legal stills up here. And they knew how to make it, so heck, they just started making liquor, and uh, and they made good liquor. And as time went along, you know, being around it, and your father being in it, and stuff, uh, it went along as I grew up, got older, I was, you know, involved in it, one way or the other, helping him, or doing whatever he told me to go do, and stuff uh, that involved uh, the whiskey business, and times was hard uh, nobody had money i was in it so deep uh, before it was all over with uh, you know it was, it was my whole life for a while moonshining was usually a family business and a way of life that was handed down from generation to generation marriages were often mergers of moonshining know-how and tradition and some of the mergers would actually be quite profitable during its heyday, five to 10 million gallons of liquor was produced each year in Wilkes County alone. But the whiskey business had its dangers too. It often led to fatal accidents and long prison sentences, tragically leaving families without any source of income at all. Back in the late uh, middle 50s, they uh, finally saw the light and started organizing. And what they did, they had one group, all they did was put the money up. And it was a lot of money because you see it was $10 and a half a proof gallon of federal tax and you had your state tax. So it was a lot of money to be made. And that group would put the money up, they wouldn't even go to the steel. And then you had a group would go down and set the distillery up. They were paid to do that. Then you had a group that would come in there and what they did was operate the steel. And they paid them by the gallon or by the hour and so forth. And then you had a group, all they did was haul the whiskey, the wholesale haulers. And that's where Junior and that crowd came in. They, that's where they learned to drive. I mean, they would haul and they'd, you know, like you say, when they would get a chase on their hands, they would go wide open. You know, I was in a manufacturing of the moonshine. I had several people working for me, I was in the hauling of the moonshine, I was in every aspect there was to be 
involved in it to make money. That was what I was into. I know plenty of shortcuts. I'm just not feeling, Junior. I've heard that ATF has been out here roaming these areas and just don't feel comfortable doing it. I've done this run during the day and I've done it at night over a dozen times. You know, lawman been born is going to catch me. Not today. I've told a lot of people after I got out, I got into the automobile racing that I had more people working for me in the moonshine business than I did in, in my stock car stuff. Really, you had to have a skill, and no one, and it was it was hard work. I mean, it wasn't easy. In other words, you had to carry a hundred pound bags of sugar up and down those mountains, and carry a five gallon uh, wooden jacketed cans of whiskey out. I mean, that wasn't easy, and you had to do it under a lot of it under cover of darkness because you know you can't come out in the wide open and be violating the law. Making moonshine was hard work, but transporting it was exciting and dangerous. To Junior, it was fun. Most others, it would be nerve-wracking to say the least. The hauling part of it was, to me, the most exciting part and the most intriguing part of it. Uh, making it, it was a pretty standard thing. If you made it, you took a chance of getting caught. They'd bring those old cars down loaded with liquor during shift change, and if you if you'd pick one out and chase it, first thing they'd do would hit a dirt road and cloud of dust and they'd bail out and you'd have a car load of liquor and that's all. You had to have a fast car, you had to be a good driver, a smart person. And out to figure all the officers of different kinds like ABC, I would throw shares and stuff of that nature. You'd look for roadblocks, bridges blocked. Uh, shoots tires down. The states for used to have a sheriff there that would throw a belt across the road with uh, spikes in it and you run off and bust all four tires. You never let your guard down because uh, you could bet there was something in store for you every time you left out. <laughs> I can't think of a night that we didn't have a race on our hands. Now, I certainly don't say we caught them all the time. We certainly didn't. But every night we went out, I mean, you'd have a race on your hands. And if you got behind Junior, you'd know it. I mean, because he, <laughs> he could motor up. It was nothing unusual uh, if you didn't get chased by that every night. To be able to manipulate that kind of uh, odds was very intriguing to a person like myself because, uh, you know, the challenge and the, the excitement part of being able to, if I got into a situation like that, to be able to take care of it and outrun them and get away from them. And, so on and so forth. I know a lot of those car folks over at NASCAR are, are tremendous drivers, but Junior, I mean, he was, he had more nerve than anybody I've ever seen. I mean, he just knew one way, and that was wide open. Junior was such a tremendous hard charger that he uh, he was either going to run up front or he was going to blow up, and uh, he did his fair share of both. I never got caught at, at all in, in the hauling side of it. I, I understood the seriousness of getting caught. Illegal whiskey manufacturers and haulers were called moonshiners. The men who chased them were called revenuers because the whiskey was non-tax paid whiskey, which of course is why it was illegal. Today the moonshiners and the revenuers both admit it was an exciting but dangerous game of cat and mouse. The, the revenue agents and the, the, the bootleggers had a code amongst themselves, yakety yak, and, and there was a code to a certain extent, but uh, they, they threw that away most of the time. I mean, it was a, a mean, mean bunch of guys uh, trying to make a living selling uh, moonshine, and the, the people chasing them were trying to put them out of business. Obviously, we were doing our job, and they were violating the federal law, and all, all the violations there were felonies under the federal law. We had a job to do, and they had a job to do, and we respected their job. If, if a bootlegger got caught, he accepted the fact he is caught, and 
That was it. The, the farmers in Wilkes County uh, we're at a tremendous disadvantage. We have fairly poor soil around here and, and uh, not many very large farms. And uh, making illicit whiskey was just a way of life for a lot of farmers. It was the way they could grow a few acres of corn and, and make some uh, corn squeezings out of it and, and make a living and, and feed their families. They didn't shoot at us and we didn't shoot at them. And they knew us all up there in Wilkes. I mean, they'd come call us by name. We knew them and sometimes they'd even follow us around. I was on top of my game and tried to stay ahead of them, like the highway patrol and the sheriffs and stuff, when they start getting short walkie-talkie radios and stuff like that. I listened to everything they had to say all the time. I never did have any trouble with anybody up in Wilkes County. I did, never did. I, it was Junior and his crowd, never had any trouble. Except trouble trying to catch him, obviously. <laughs> but we had a good time. It was probably a game to me, but not just me. There's a lot of other people in Wilkes County that had them too, so. It was kind of a contest who had the fastest one. It always is. It took more than driving skills in a fast car to beat the law every time. Junior employed innovation in his moonshining career too. His tactics included things like putting a siren and light on his whiskey car to fool the revenuers into thinking he was a local lawman. Or he would drop oil on his hot exhaust pipe, creating an instant smoke screen. Cutting off his lights, he would disappear into the night forever. They would put two spotlights mounted on the back bumper. Well, you jump them at night and you first thing you come to a curb and all of a sudden you get a blinding light hit you in the eyes and you all, all you could do to get your car stopped, not worrying about him. And so, uh, and then they get away obviously. We didn't think that was quite kosher so we started using what they call a wampus. In other words, a, a thick uh, canvas and had spikes in it. And when that liquor car hit the wampus, you know, it would punch him and pull the tire just about off the rim. And then we'd come up and apprehend him. And so, <laughs> they, they sent word to us that if, if we would quit using the wampuses, they would quit using the, the light, the spotlights. And so we kind of had a code of the hills and we agreed and neither one of us used it anymore. The, the biggest, the most evasive uh, tactic uh, was simply to outrun them and get on a dirt road and cloud the road with dust so they couldn't see it and, and also made it very dangerous for the following car. A lot of those guys knew those roads so well that sometimes they just turned all the lights out and they became a, a ghost. They used to have a little old policeman set up here at Mossville. And he weighed about 400 pounds. And he just sat there and sleep all the time. And it, he weighed so much, old Chivalry would be sitting there. And it's all flopped over on one side where he's sitting on a stern wheel. And when we go on load down and hear something or another and go back through there, He'd be sitting there asleep and we'd pull up side of him. He'd jump up and get up there and get old sterling wheel, crank that thing up, turn his blue light up, and here he'd come running out through there about 40, 50 mile an hour, you know, like he's going to catch us. <laughs> this is a 39 Ford Coupe. It's got a black grill in it, and this was the favored car of the moonshiners because it was so plain looking. Just like in racing, the whiskey runners had to know their cars and stay current in technology and innovation. The bootlegger was the car owner, driver, engineer, and pit crew. They had to do it all to survive. It was almost a must that you had to know how to work on your car, know what to do to it, and keep innovating stuff into you, your moonshine cars to have better cars and, and the highway patrol or the ABC officers and stuff like that. They don't bounce around and jump around like other cars do, so. It's rare to see one of them in the condition this car is in. You could probably take this thing right to bed and uh, put a good seat belt in it and uh, 
you'd be surprised how fast it'd run around this racetrack right here. Because uh, the aerodynamic, they're about as aerodynamic as anything you'll see on the road. So we constantly upgraded our cars to get more speed out of them, get more drivability out of them, better tires, better wheels, better sway bars, axles, everything, you know. I kept the insides, you know, just like it was, other than the, you know, I put some leather seats in it, but steering wheel and speedometer, it's all pretty much like it was. Man. Uh, you like that steering wheel? <laughs> <laughs> some of their mechanics became very adept at getting the most out of these cars possible. There's the link right there between the racer and the bootlegger. I think that's the groundwork was laid uh, for the stock cars today. We were smart enough to know that if this piston's this size and it makes a certain horsepower, if it's this size, make twice as so much horsepower. You know, and we, we had ventured into that uh, blindfold. But it was the right correction. Just knew how to make, make a car go. Uh, he was, uh, I remember one time we took uh, the manifold coming out, and he had, wheel, had pipes going everywhere. He played on the dyno though to see which one I gave more horsepower, which way the pipes. No one ever worked on the pipes before. There was another big link, and that is the fact that uh, uh, the, uh, the people that drove these bootleg cars. They weren't old men, they were kids. They were teenagers, mostly. Number one, they had little fear. Number two, they were available, cheap. And uh, number three, they did not have a criminal record. We uh, wound up really making race cars in reality out of our bootlegging cars. And they got caught if it was a federal offense and they confiscated the car. If they didn't, the revenue uh, agents didn't use it themselves, then they sold it at auction. And finally, uh, I was about 16 and a half and, and making my own money, and, and I bought one of them. A good bootlegging car was sitting somewhere to a house or a barn or something, loading up, and the revenues come in and caught it. Then they had the same thing you had. So you, it, it left you then with the, who's the best driver. They had something to drive for. I mean, it, I know it wasn't the, the, the money they get today, but back then it was their liberty. And, and that's why they would learn to drive. And they started driving young ages, and they could learn to drive because they didn't want to get caught. Junior was one of a whole lot of them. He, was, he, he just, just became extremely prominent by being uh, uh, one of the, the best ones to go over and race. And uh, there were a lot of drivers uh, uh, back in the 40s and 50s that drove stock cars that would not admit they were they were bootleggers and so you could never come out and say he was junior never worried about that i think he knew he was the uh, king of the hill i think he knew he was the best driver up there and if he was the best driver in wilkes county then obviously he's the best driver in the state uh, and i think he had that uh, little cocky attitude and I don't blame him, I probably would have been too because he, he built up a reputation like I said and that's what the first the, the violators would do I mean it always challenged him he was the, he was the, the guideline if you if you could outrun junior then you were you were good I never got caught at, at all in, in the hall inside of it. and I'd done went through the whole my whole career of the bootlegging business and I was into the racing business and I'd signed a contract to drive cars and not do anything else but drive cars. But the Johnson family business would finally catch up with Junior. His prominent position in racing was about to come to a screeching halt. After winning yet another race, Junior went home and suddenly found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. He may have never been caught hauling liquor, but he was about to get caught with his shovel in hand. I had won a race in Oxford, Pennsylvania 
on a Saturday night and I come in and about uh, that morning it was almost daylight when I got home. And my dad and my brother had a still back over in the woods the other side of the house and both of them had kind of overslept and my dad, he asked me to go fire a still up for him because if you didn't fire it up and get the smoke away before daylight, somebody would see the smoke and they said, well, Mr. Johnson's got a still over in the holler. I didn't think anything about doing what my dad said. If it was today, I'd still go do what he asked me to do. When I went into the still, there was nobody but me there. And I was firing the still up, and I'd got the fire going real good. And I'd uh, heard my brother and one of my uncles coming up through the woods down there. I said, you know, I'll fire the burner one more time, then I'm going to the house. They can f take it from here. When I reached over to shovel some coke up and stick it in the burner, I heard something right behind me. John West, I think, was the one that actually apprehended him. And it was four or five. Uh, he said about, uh, I don't know, about eight, 10 or 12 agents, I believe. I forgot what he said. But really, I think it was about four agents there, but they did apprehend him. And I looked over my shoulder. And there's a guy standing on top of a box just fixing to jump on the back of my, on my back, you know. So instead of throwing the coke in the burner, I just throw it, come back over my shoulder like that and hit him in the face with it and all that stuff. And he was a well-known revenue there in Wilkesburg that uh, uh, everybody knew him. His name was John West. And uh, when I hit him with that shovel, he hollered out, you know, catch Junior Johnson, he's hit me in the head with a shovel. Well, they had it surrounded. They had the thing staked out. It's probably 15 officers, you know, all through the woods. I had got away from John down through the woods and I, I knew where there was opening in the gate of the fence down there. and I. I Knowed I was going to have to hit that opening. If I didn't, I was going to run into that fence. And, and I did miss the opening in the fence. And I hit in that barbed wire fence and got tangled up in. And John and two other guys uh, caught me. Junior was off to federal prison in Ohio, where he stayed for 11 months and three days. When I come out of penitentiary, I learned. In, the, in prison, you had to do what was right or you was in trouble all the time. And, and I, it was a great lesson for me. I never fooled the whiskey business after that. I, I went on and got bigger and bigger in the racing when I got out. And I don't say I turned my life, my life around, I just, you know, went in a different direction. There were attempts made uh, within the industry to try to keep this completely quiet. They wanted to wipe the bootleg thing out, and particularly as we got toward the beginning of the super speedway era. And this plagued Junior Johnson's career to a certain extent in, the, in his early days. In 1947, at Daytona Beach, Florida, the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing was organized. This new association, called NASCAR, was organized by race promoters seeking to promote the sport of racing and clean up its questionable image. A lot was done to try to keep Junior from getting to the top of his profession of racing uh, because uh, he did have a record and uh, a lot of people uh, were trying to improve the image of, of, of racing, which in those days wasn't very good. But Junior couldn't be stopped. His constant innovation led him to the discovery of drafting. Junior Johnson pours it out in first place. Despite the fact he was driving a much slower car, he used this drafting technique in 1960 to win the Daytona 500. Coming out of the second turn, the rear window on number three tore out, and the rush of air lifted the rear wheels off the track. Johns was driving on ice at 152 miles an hour. Junior Johnson grabs first place.
Eight days before race day, Junior was asked by Ray Fox to run in the 1960 Daytona 500. There's the green flag. Junior's 59 Chevy was much slower than the 1960 Pontiacs he was about to compete against. We was at Daytona and I was driving a car for the dog track, which is right outside the racetrack there. Ray Fox was working on a car and it was a 59 Chevrolet. Well, in 59 Pontiac was in racing. They was building high-powered motors and stuff like that. And they built it just to race and we had a stock car. That's why we had a stock car. And it had a 409 cubic inch motor in it. And 409 cubic inch motors was made for trucks. It wasn't made for a race car. And I something like 30 mile an hour, 37 I believe it was, slower than the guy that sat on the pole. Ray kept telling me, I'll get it better, I'll get it better. We, you know, we'll get it more to keep up. And I was a jack man. I was a big old fat boy and I could jump across with a, with a jack pretty strong. And we sort of uh, got ahead of the, the curve on jacks because uh, we took, a, the jacket took the best I can make, it took 13 strokes to get the, the jack up to get it off the ground. But uh, then I was a big fat boy, I, we put it down to where it took three strokes to get it up. So I'd hit it three times and be up and go to the front tires, push it in, then jack, jerk the car out and go around the other side and work on the front tire over there. And the whole time it, when the car would hit the pits, Ray Fox would be, before you ever got to jack up, he'd be slapping on the hood, go, 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 go. That's the most nervous man that's ever been in the pits in the world, it's Ray Fox. He'd go all through heck. When the car came in, it's all to pieces. And Junior knew they had somebody who was a good mechanic. I mean, he was a good, good, he knew how to build cars. Even though Junior thought about packing it up and heading home, Ray promised to make the car run faster. And Cotton Owens come by. And when he come by, I just stuck the door in behind him. All of a sudden, my car started picking up speed, and I just run right up against him and stayed there to eight or ten laps. Junior Johnson pours it on. You know, like that, well, hanging on to him, the thing was turning about 7,500 or 8,000 RPMs, and that's a, that was unheard of then. The pit crew realized what Junior was doing, because we knew dang well that the car would not run that fast by itself on the racetrack. But when we got in the race, Junior would get in with somebody else, another fight, a car comparable to his or a little faster than his, he'd get right under him and go with him. And then he would slingshot around him when he got ready to win the race. What nobody knew at the time was that Junior had discovered the aerodynamic draft from the car in front of him. I told him, I said, Ray, I think I can, I can run with them boys. He said, how are you going to do that? I didn't want to tell him that, I, you know, I found a, hanging on to them and drafting them. If nobody else finds out nothing about it, I've got an advantage. Finally, on the 170th lap of the race, Bobby Johns passed Junior for the lead. For the next 20 laps, Junior drafted, hanging on to Bobby Johns' faster Pontiac when Junior witnessed one of the strangest things ever to happen on a racetrack. And he's spinning! He's holding it! No! He's into the infield! And he recovers. He's back in the race. Coming out of the second turn, the rear window on number three tore out, and the rush of air lifted the rear wheels off the track. Johns was driving on ice at 152 miles an hour. Junior Johnson grabs first place. Bobby Johns, after his amazing recovery, is still second. With my car sucking off Miss back glass and and uh, the wind going inside the car too, it jerked his back glass out. When he jerked his back glass out, heck, he, this, his whole car come up off the ground, it spun around, went down the infield, and I went off, and I won the race. The so everybody knew then by the time the race was about over with, what I had done all day long was just drafted people, you know, and. And that's how I got to where I was at. Amazingly, Junior took the checkered flag 23 seconds in front of Johns. The victory at the Daytona 500 was Junior Johnson's biggest win ever. To win Daytona Beach being that much slower than anybody else is just absolutely a luck type deal. And, uh, and 
you know, like a dream come true thing. He wanted to race cars. We wanted somebody that we could sponsor our, sell our chickens, and his name would sell chickens. He was a chicken grower, a car racer, and he became a well-known name, and strictly through the southeast, not necessarily New York City or California, but the southeast. And we thought he'd be a good spokesperson, although he didn't talk a lot about it, but he'd be a good, a good name to hang our hat on, and we did. And I think probably the first year we spent very little money because all the work was done of course out of our own garages that worked on trucks uh, most of the time and on a couple of days a week to work on a race car and uh, we had some some good times now junior in 1964 in one of the milestone uh, deals in the growth of this sport uh, when Tom Wolf came down and, and did a profile on him that tabbed him uh, the last American hero, and later put him in his tangerine Kool-Aid uh, acid whip book that he that he wrote, and uh, Junior was the predominant chapter in that. So he got a lot of national exposure. And he wanted to go out on top, and he decided that he could be a car owner, and he knew enough about cars. And I think he thinks there's more money. Junior's pretty tight with the dollar. He felt like there's a heck of a lot more money to be made as a car owner than he could as a, as a uh, driver. And they probably, then I'm sure they are. Kale, when he became one of the, the national champion, told the lady that had the check, the checks came to, said, I want all the national champion money. You said, oh no. He said, I'm the driver. <laughs> and you said, split it just like we've always split it, said you wasn't driving a bicycle, you was driving my car and I will, will split it just like we always have. And that's what they did. <laughs> no, just, uh, I think Junior felt like he could be more profitable with less danger to himself uh, as a car owner than it, and it was. And he wanted to go out as Junior Johnson, not go out as a uh, Junior Johnson has been run on the tail end, and because he was not a he was not a, a follower, he was a leader, and he was a leader when he went out. So he's he's ended up being a leader all the way. Most major manufacturers had pulled their sponsorship money out of racing by the end of the '60s, until in 1970, cigarette companies could no longer advertise on TV or radio. Of course, Junior recognized this as an opportunity to bring money to racing and the financially strapped NASCAR. Junior said, hey, I'll get go over there and I'll get Winston to sponsor a car, Camel to sponsor one, and, and uh, uh, Salem to sponsor one. They said, we don't want to sponsor cars, but we might be interested in sponsoring a circuit. And the next thing you know, the NASCAR people got involved in it and it became uh, the Winston Cup circuit. And that was in 72, I believe and the rest is sort of history. It, it proved to be one of the best sports marketing ventures that corporate America has ever been involved with. Winston Cup racing would remain a NASCAR tradition for the next 32 years. Junior had been nominated for the Sports Hall of Fame every year since 1971. However, his felony conviction for moonshining had always kept him from being inducted. Finally, his wish came true. In 1982, President Ronald Reagan called Junior up to the White House. It was almost like a Cinderella type thing for me. When that first happened, uh, when Reagan gave him a pardon, I, I, I was... A little perturbed, uh, but now when you look back on it, I, I wasn't all that bad. And I think Junior's done a lot for uh, the economy. I mean, certainly, so I have no problem. I'm kind of glad he did. But if you'd asked me back then, in the 50s and the 60s, I'd, I'd have said, "Hey, crazy! Didn't even think about getting no part." But I think if you look back on it and you mellow a little bit with age, and I think that's probably the right thing to do. 
In 1981, Junior Johnson had filed the request for his presidential pardon. I started uh, my pardon process underneath of Jimmy Carter because I was good friends with Jimmy Carter. Uh, I knew him from a time that he ran for governor down in Georgia and it went through his whole process of the investigations and stuff like that. And it wound up under Ronald Reagan. Some people contended that Junior was nothing more than a common criminal, but those who knew him spoke kindly on his behalf. He got a pardon from Ronald Reagan because he really didn't do anything wrong. Uh, I mean, that's what they do up in the, in the mountains. They still do some of it, you know. <laughs> to be asked to come to White House to receive the pardon from President Reagan personally was a great honor. If you would have told me he'd ended up like he was, I'd have said, you're all crazy. No way. But uh, he's really turned into a great uh, uh, elder spokes spokesman for the, for the industry today. I said, you know, I said, here you are, probably a uh, multi-billionaire. You made all your money on the stock car racing and so forth. And I said, I'm not envious of it. But I said, you know, we helped train you. And I said, yeah, he laughed. He said, yeah, but you didn't catch us that much. Despite their chases, arrests, and jail time, Millard, Jr., and the other Wilkes County boys still get along with Bob and the other revenuers that tried to hunt them down. We, we had a good time, I mean, and, and it, it, was, it was all right, you know, as long as you had good people to deal with. Get along fine now. I, I never thought we would. Yeah, I run into Bob a lot. He was uh, pretty aggravating. <laughs> In 1998, Junior Johnson was named by Sports Illustrated as the greatest driver in the history of NASCAR. If you could have told me back in those days that, that Miller and Junior would be millionaires a day, I wouldn't have believed it. There are no hard feelings shared between the moonshiners of Wilkes County and revenuers who tried to stop them. There is only mutual respect for the hard work and innovation they each put forth. Went through some bad times and had some sad things happen. Some way, somehow, I survived it. And, and it, uh, when I look back on it, it, you know, you say, well, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't done this. I wouldn't take anything for the adventures I had in life in the moonshine bed. I don't have any regrets of anything that's happened to me in my life. I'm a very, very honest person, and I think I'm a good person. I've done a lot of things for a lot of people, and uh, I've been blessed. They come down to Junior and say, Junior, can you come? We can't get this car to run two hundred miles. It runs one ninety nine point something, one ninety eight or one ninety nine all, but we can't get to run two hundred. What can we do to it? And Junior looked at him and said, You better go up and work on the clock. <laughs> so you don't said so the car's not gonna run that fast, just work on the clock a little bit. And they come back a few laps later and it was running two hundred miles an hour. <laughs> but that's just one of those things that uh Junior got cut through the Cram got right to the, to the meat of the business when he talked to you. <laughs> well, come on, I want you to get in it. I want to <clears throat> let you feel, bring back some memories for you. I kept the insides, you know, just like it was, other than the, you know, I put some leather seats in it, but steering wheel and speedometer, it's all pretty much like oh. it was. Man. Well, it, fe it feels like 39 standard used to feel because of the spring, uh, you know, the bounce of the cars, basically what I, I'm i used to driving back in the, you know, the bootlegging days. Junior's opportunity to get out of racing came in 1995 when he sold his racing team for the third and final time. Today, Junior and his family live atop a hill in Yadkin County facing old US 421, a road Junior knows well. This is one of the Whiskey Roads where Junior started his liquor hauling career that helped make him the legend he is.
He now spends his time working on his 300-acre cattle farm with his wife, Lisa, and their two young children, Meredith and Robert. There isn't a race car in sight. I don't want to see him in race. I think it's uh, too hard a thing for a young person. I want him to have a good education, finish college, and manage his money well because I'm going to leave him so. Two things that'll never stop running down the mountainside are race cars and whiskey. But no one has ever combined the two as successfully as Junior Johnson. <laughs>